All right. So, Jonas, glad to meet you. This is the first time that we've talked, and you've told me that you're on Copangan, so you can co come visit a little later. Uh, but because of my hearing so bad, when people are with me, I have to keep asking them to repeat things over and over again, but I've got enough volume on the headphones so that I can generally hear what you have to say. So as we had started talking, I thought that it would be good to mention that there are two Buddhisms. There is ordinary Buddhism, which has a lot of magical thinking and does not have release from suffering. It's in fact, basically Hinduism with a lot of Buddhist words. And this is the primary of throughout the world. Let's say that more than 90% of people who call themselves Buddhist are of an ordinary kind. And then there is the other kind, which we will call noble or super mundane. And when we say super mundane, that means above the world, out of the world, not part of the world. And that over many, many centuries, the teaching of the Buddha has become polluted. And the place that it's become polluted is by people who want to know the teachings of the Buddha and approach it with their own confirmational bias. So they bring their baggage with them. In order to go into the noble, we've got to drop all of that baggage and see things the way that they really are. Mm. So another way of mentioning it is, is to say that ordinary Buddhism is magical thinking. It's magical, and it's got all kinds of magical things in it because people want magic. And an example is people want magical power. Why do people want magical power? Well, they want magical power so that they can have power over other people. That's ego. Or they want magical power in order for them to feel safe and secure. Because I've got the power, I can do what I want to do, and I'm not going to get caught. Or if I do get caught, I can still get away with it. And this is the normal way that people approach it. A better way of thinking in the noble respect would be that if you have no fear, then you don't want or need to develop magical powers. Right? Right. Yeah, yeah okay. So basically, the real noble teaching of the Buddha is how to fix your own mind so that you're comfortable, happy, and satisfied with it. But most Buddhism is about magical thinking. Another example of that would be the issue of rebirth and reincarnation. That if people are afraid to die, then they don't want to die. Therefore, when somebody gives them a magic elixir so that you could be reborn, then people like that idea. But if you're not afraid, especially not afraid of death, then it's okay for you to die, and then you don't need and you're not interested in rebirth and reincarnation. It's irrelevant to the practice. Now, I'm not saying that rebirth or reincarnation do not exist. Nobody knows. No one's come back from the dead. Yeah. All right. Nobody's done that. There's a lot of stories about a few people who have. Most of them wind up being zombies. <laughs> and the funny part about it is those who do come back from the dead die again, and then they don't come back from the dead. So they maybe have not been all that dead in the first place. Or it's just stories. But people like these stories because it gives them comfort. It would be better if you had comfort based in reality rather than based in magical thinking. And so what has happened is with the practice of Anapanasati or the, uh, the practice of what is called meditation has become that way with people who are practicing who still keep their magical beliefs. And so they're wanting something magical out of it. Well, 
there was a lot of people like that for thousand thousand years ago. Mm. In fact, we can trace the events of the teachings of the Buddha and how they evolved. And they evolved into kind of a, a, a strange form of Buddhism about 500, I mean, strange form of Hinduism about 500 AD, about the time of the Vasudhi Maga. And the Vasudhi Maga, therefore, is not trustable. That if you want to trust literature, go back to the original suttas. And we have, over time, uh, with scholarly research, begin to figure out which are the original suttas and which ones have been added later. For sure, Abhidhamma, commentary, Vasudhi Maga, and all of that stuff is much later, and therefore is not really worth our time and effort because we can get everything we need out of the suttas. Except that when magical thinking people really want to know the Dhamma, they become translators. And guess what? They translate their uh, confirmational bias so right. that what you wind up with is a magical translation of reality. <laughs> And so that's the problem with things like rebirth is the Buddha didn't teach rebirth at all, not anywhere near like the magical kind that, in fact, if you want to use the word rebirth, it's that it happens in the mind over and over and over and over again. You're happy and then your reborn is sad and then your reborn is angry, and then your reborn is upset, and then later your reborn is OK, and then you're reborn happy. You see, like that. That's the way that it goes. It's a mood change. Mm. So and Eric, you would give the right to a new life to a new incarnation, kind of. Pardon? Like every kind of mood or feeling gives rise to a new rebirth, you could say so. Right. And yeah. a new you. Yeah. That the you that's angry is not the same you that's happy. Mm. True. Sure. Okay. That's the important point, is to recognize that whoever you are is a moving target. Mm. It's a moving target. Yeah. And so let's not worry about who you are. In fact, that, the Buddha says, is unwise attention, is to try to figure out who you were in the past, who you were in the future, or will be in the future, and who you are now. And how you got from the past to now and how you get from now to the future, the Buddha says, all of that is unwise attention. Yeah. What is wise attention is to look at what's happening right now. That's what the real wise attention is, is to see what's happening right now. Is this dukkha or what? If this is dukkha, where did it come from? How did it get here? Then we re regard it in the sense of how can we get ourselves into a really good, comfortable, happy state? And then we look at how we can uh, practice to get there. So these are the Four Noble Truths. There is Dukkha. It does exist. It is not magical. It does not come from the outside like a tsunami or a hailstorm or whatever, is not a cause of dukkha. Standing in a hailstorm and getting hit by hail, that's the dukkha, but it's because you're standing out in the hailstorm. <laughs> <laughs> and if you were wise enough, you wouldn't stand in the hailstorm. You'd get out of it. Yeah. And so this is the whole point is all of our problems of life are created within one's mind. And so the actual practice of the Buddha is to get ourselves out of that difficulty and live a happy, comfortable life. That's what it's really all about. And so the fourth noble truth is how do we practice that? What are what is the, the path or the method? Now, one of the problems with the translations that have been done by magically thinking people is, is that they think that uh, it's a path in the sense of you've got to walk the path, that it's over time. You start here, 
then you walk a while, and then you rest, and then you walk uh, again. And after a thousand miles or a thousand hours of practice, finally you get someplace. Okay. Brilliant. I have to talk about like so much like this, like this huge system and so many different meditations and so many attainments that I, you have to make. Uh, so it it feels like kind of overwhelming, a little bit. And well, here's here's another point on that. And that is, is that the teachings of the Buddha is not about attaining anything. Everything about the teachings of the Buddha is a dead loss. Yeah. Until you lose everything and then you've got nothing left. All right. That's the whole teaching is, is that it's a teaching of dropping whatever is hot right now and keep dropping whatever you find is hot right now. What's yeah. to attain? We're only dropping. But you use the word attainment, that's Western Buddhism. Western Buddhism has attainments. The teachings of the Buddha himself is no attainments, nothing. Yeah. All right, so there is nothing to attain. But getting back to the point that I was making about the Eightfold Noble Path, is, is that it's a bad translation. It's not a path. Mm. A better word to use would be way, but an even better word would be method. The method mm -hmm. that you apply right here will get you out of dukkha right here, right now. That's the method. Imagine that it's like this. Imagine that the whole thing is a door to open. Let us say that you're standing in a hailstorm, and all you need to do is open the door that's right in front of you and go into the safe place. But most people think that that door is a thousand miles, and you've got to practice and practice and practice and walk and talk and do this, that, and the other thing. And someday, somehow, regardless of which path you took, you eventually get to the door. Guess what? The door is already there. It's right in front of you. And so we have to practice the Eightfold Noble Path as if it were a method of merely opening the door that's right in front of us. And the first part of that is, is to remember that the door is right in front of us. And then we look and we inspect and we figure out how to open the door. And then we put the effort into opening the door. And then there we are. That's all there is to it. It's something that happens right here, right now. Which means then that the, with the concept of the Four Noble Truths, the very, very beginner, the first time that he practices with beginner's luck, he can go immediately right into the Third Noble Truth. Nothing to attain. It's already there. You don't have to work on it. Any working that you put into it that gives you no result is merely wrong effort, not right effort. Yeah. If you're practicing right effort, it takes you right into the state that we're intending to go to. Mm. But, but how to remain there once we open the door and stepped in? Like I, I feel you, myself, I, I doing this quite often, but I always fall out again. Right. Well, what that means is something came in to mm -hmm. the mind, which took you out of that state. Yeah. Right. And so part of the practice eventually is to apply the mind to the wholesome and then learn to sustain the mind in the wholesome. To apply the mind to the wholesome and sustain the mind in the wholesome is a skill to be developed. It's not going to happen magically. You have to keep practicing over and over again to get yourself into a good state. And then, while you're in that good state, practice to sustain it. What's that Rather than just getting yourself into a good state and then just, you know, fall out the window or something. <laughs> What's the, the wholesome? How how you define like the the wholesome? How to understand? 
All right. The Buddha is actually quite big on that, and he refers to it in many ways. One of the ways he refers to it is obstructions. Another word that's used is hindrances. The hindrances that hinder us from being in a good state of mind. So those those hindrances, then, we can think of as all of them are unwholesome thoughts. Yeah. Now, unwholesome thoughts, we can tell you immediately, if you're thinking about something that's already happened, if you're thinking about the past, if you're thinking about fixing the past, is the same as thinking about the future. So, thinking about the past and thinking about the future is unwholesome. The past is gone and the future is yet to be, doesn't exist. Neither one of them exists. The only thing that really exists, the reality, is always right here, right now. That's the only reality you'll ever have, is the reality that's happening in the here now. Yeah. Yeah, that's an important point because most students, if you want to know what hindrances are, it's any thought that you have that's not right here, right now. So thinking about Chicago is not a wholesome thought. It's an ordinary thought. Wanting to go to Chicago, that's definitely an unwholesome thought. Because you're already good enough right where you are. Why go anyplace? You're already here. So if we go ahead. All the time. Pardon? I feel like I, I do this a lot. I project a lot myself to the future. Also, like according to meditation, that I often think, oh, I have to do one more retreat or master this or that. Or, yeah, yeah. I feel like yeah, I'm living a lot in the future. Well, you were trained that way. Uh, as part of our society, in a way that you can call it is confirmation bias. You have the bias that you're not good enough right now and you got to do something to get good enough. Yeah. Okay, but the confirmation bias can be in the other direction that you can confirm that you're already okay. You don't need anything. I like that, yeah. All right, well, that's the teaching of the Buddha is the right here, right now. Be, feel good right here, right now. So thoughts of the past, thoughts of the future, and thoughts of someplace else is not going to keep you in a really good state of paying attention to the right now. So that's the answer to the question, wholesome versus unwholesome. The next point is, is to understand that what's wholesome and what's unwholesome is a skill for you to develop. Mm. That in the beginning, the students will think that all this thought is wholesome, but later when you begin to get some insights into what's going on, you'll recognize that all oh, this thought too is unwholesome, better let it go. And so we can actually put out that there are uh, thoughts will come into three groups. And that is on one end, way on the right hand side, you can say that we know that these thoughts definitely are unwholesome. Thoughts of harm, thoughts of hurting someone, thoughts of revenge, thoughts of getting even. Mm -hmm. um, those thoughts absolutely 100% unwholesome. And then we can see that some thoughts would be absolutely wholesome. What kind of thoughts were that? Everything's all right, everything is fine, no place to go, nothing to do, and I feel really good. I feel safe, I feel secure, comfortable, satisfied right now. Those would be the kind of thoughts that would be wholesome. Another way of looking at it is in the Anapanasati Sutta, the Buddha uses the word that's translated into gladdening the mind or brightening the mind that we intentionally have thoughts that, brad, that brighten and gladden the mind. An example would be, I'm safe. I don't have to go any place to be safe. I'm already safe right now. I'm safe and secure and comfortable. So these would be thoughts that would be definitely wholesome. And then all the other 10,000 kinds of thoughts is up to you to figure out 
are they wholesome? Is this thought actually a thought of revenge? No. Okay. Or is this thought wholesome? If you're thinking about right here, right now, in a joyous, happy way, that thought is wholesome. So you're also saying that we kind of try to generate more wholesome thoughts? That's something that we do like consciously? Otherwise, you're going to unconsciously generate unwholesome thoughts because that's the habit you're in. Definitely. So yeah. it takes it takes effort. Mm -hmm. And the Buddha talks about right effort as part of the Eightfold Noble Path. We have to do the right effort. And for the very, very beginner, then, right effort is a little bit effortful. But as you gain the skill of right effort, it actually becomes easier. Uh, that actually the Eightfold Noble Path has three aspects to it that are very important for the beginner. And that is sati to remember. Number two is ditti to wake up, which means to look, to remember to look, to remember to wake up and take a look at what the mind is doing right here, right now. So sati can also be referred to as coming into the present moment. Yeah. And then the right effort then is to see that these thoughts are wholesome or unwholesome and then change it from an unwholesome thought to a wholesome thought. And so these three things run around each other. They run in a circle in the sense that as they're going around together, they build each other up as skills. In other words, the more often you remember, then the more likely you are to remember. Mm, it's a repetition I make over and over again until the it's a repetition to remember. Now, that's one of the things about this. Uh, the Mahasi method is they do teach sati. Congratulations, they get about two out of four. <laughs> Because they do remember to look. That's what the noting is all about, is to look. But what the, the what is a failure is, is to that they look at what it is without making the discrimination of, is this thought wholesome or unwholesome? They just say, oh, this is dukkha, and this is dukkha, and that's dukkha, and this dukkha is related to that dukkha. That, in fact, the, the Buddha um, teaches that he says he teaches only one thing, dukkha, dukkha naroda. By the time the Western mind gets a hold of that, they hear him say, dukkha, more dukkha, look at this dukkha, see how that dukkha is related to that dukkha, and just wallow in dukkha. Get yourself really, really miserable so that you'll know what dukkha is all about. And students do that, and they get themselves really miserable. Okay, why? Because they're not taking the right effort to once you see dukkha, I mean, just the hint or just a shadow of the dukkha is enough For you to say that's dukkha, let's stay out of it. Mm. And that's the right effort. The right effort is to throw out the dukkha and come to a state of sukha. And the state of sukha is defined as safe, secure, comfortable, satisfied. So these are the kind of gladdening terms or the kind of wholesome thoughts that we want to have or the kind of wholesome thoughts that tell us we're safe, we're secure, we're comfortable, and we're satisfied. And we practice safe, secure, comfortable, and satisfied over and over and over again, remembering to take a look at what we're doing and make a change. The whole teachings of the Buddha is around making a change, not just investigating what's there and not making a change. We have to make a change. That's the right effort, is to change it from an unwholesome to a wholesome thought. And when we do that, these three things over and over and over again, to wake up, take a look and make a change, to wake up, uh, take a look at what's happening and make a change, those three things will build a skill, a skill set. 
And also it builds something else because every time that you make that change, we recognize that we have made a change. This is the success that we're looking for. And so we begin to add a fourth ingredient, which would be called success, or it would also be called uh, an attitude of success, an attitude that I can do this. And so this is the fourth item on the Eightfold Noble Path is, uh, and the Pali word is Sama Sankapa. And that means to feel like a winner. That we started off as children as a victim. We didn't know how to talk. We didn't know how to feed ourselves. We didn't know how to put on clothes. We start off as a victim. By the time we're three or four or five years old, we recognize that mommy's a big person and I'm a little person. And so that victimhood gets ground in. And then we start school, and when we start school, that's all about you do what you're told to do. You learn the ABCs. You learn the one, two, threes. Go clean your room. And now we still remain a victim, and that victimhood is ground in deeper and deeper and deeper. So by the time that we're adults, we already have the attitude that I'm a loser. That's why I want Buddhism, is because I already recognize that I'm not a winner. If I were a winner, I wouldn't need any teachings. I would already have what I was looking for. And so anybody who comes to Buddhism or to the teachings of the Buddha or any religion for that matter is coming to it from the position of a victim. Christianity capitalizes on that by telling you, you can't do it on your own. You need a Jesus. Yeah. All right. Okay. But this is actually practicing success practicing satisfaction over and over and over again until you become successful at being satisfied. And when we do this, the mind gets reorganized. In fact, it gets organized for the first time because before this, we were a victim crowd with a mommy and a daddy and all kinds of rules and everything like that that prevent us from being uh, comfortable secure, safe, satisfied, and successful right here in this present moment. So this is the way to practice, is to practice dropping all of the things that keep you from being satisfied, including and especially unwholesome thoughts. And so this is how we practice. Now, this is the Eightfold Noble Path. When the mind is, in fact, unified, when the mind is noble, when, in fact, you come to the state that you're free from dukkha, that means that you don't want anything. Mm -hmm. If you don't want anything, then you're unlikely to kill anybody to get it. If you don't want anything, you're unlikely to steal it. Right. If, you're, if you don't want anything, you're unlikely to lie to somebody about it. So morality actually is the final result of having an organized mind that is free from dukkha. It's a noble mind. And yet Buddhism is taught upside down. It teaches sila first, sila, samati, panya, but the noble path is panya, samati, sila. And in this regard, the word samati means organization. It means unification. It means bringing all of the factors together rather than missing out on something. This is not concentration. Concentration is something completely different. In fact, concentration has several different definitions. Almost all of them are wrong. One definition of concentration is correct, and that is you do it over and over and over and over again. So if a child is concentrating on her homework, she does the first uh, arithmetic example, and then she does the second one. She continues on, and she repeats that process and does the third example, and she doesn't just dis get distracted, so she goes and does the fourth example. Okay, that's the kind of concentration because it's repetitive over and over and over and over again, and this is the kind of concentration that we're developing. It's not a tight nose, tight lipped, tight mind 
with the burrs sprout, you know, like this, and just working really hard is the way that we normally think of as concentration. Basically, that uh, uh, first grader student who is learning arithmetic, learning her numbers, when she concentrates, because she was told to concentrate, is pretending to work hard. Pretending to work hard is a kind of concentration. And that's not at all what we're doing here. What we're doing is getting the mind in a really good state and then repeating it and repeating it and repeating it over and over and over again. This is what uh, we are, are practicing to get the mind into a state of safe, secure, comfortable, and satisfied, and then organized around the attitude of being a winner, that we could do this. You know, the Buddha was referred to as a lion. Yeah. Well, how does he become a lion? Well, it's the confidence. The confidence of can do, or in this case, the confidence that I can refrain from doing. And so that's why we're not attaining anything. We're losing. What are we losing? We're losing unwholesome thoughts. We're losing fear. We're losing anger. We're losing uh, incompetence. But we're not gaining anything. Because you've been happy before, so you're not gaining happiness. Just practice it. You already know how to be happy. But we don't practice it well. So that's the kind of an answer to your question about attainments. There's nothing to attain. It's a dead loss. And when you lose it all, there's nothing left. Sunyata or sunyata, nothing's left. Because you got rid of all the crap. And didn't attain anything. Then yeah, in really, fact, go ahead. Really uh, interesting to, to see it like this way. Because uh, before in, in my practice, I always had the feeling I need to get somewhere. And um, I kind of and liked how how they do it in, in, in Zen Buddhism, that it is just about the here and now and just the plain sitting. Uh, this helped me quite a lot to really, yeah, appreciate the present moment and to not work so hard. Because I found like another teaching that's really like the approach to work hard. You have to work hard. You have to put like strong effort. Wanker makes a point of it, right. Work, uh, you've got to work, he says. You've heard that. It's not like a huge burden, like a huge task that you have to 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 accomplish like a huge pile that you have to to work down and yeah i, I see this also like with other meditators that they are kind of mm -hmm. well imagine that you've got a, a vacant lot a, and a, a Kawanka lot. tells you a vacant lot a lot that has no pro no buildings on it uh, empty land mm -hmm. okay all right and many of the meditation teachers says, oh, you've got to build something on this land. You got to build a skyscraper. You got to build a city or something like that. You got to work. And the teaching of the Buddha is, hey, you've got a vacant lot here. Sit down and enjoy it. <laughs> you have to actually stop. You have to put your tools down and enjoy the fact that you've got nothing done. You don't have to work. Mm. What we need to do is stop working. And that's the right effort. The right effort is stop working. That's why it's so difficult for Westerners to do this. It's a, it's a complete paradigm shift. Right. It's yeah. subtle. It's profound. But it's not difficult to do. It's a change of attitude. Yeah. Yeah, it's really the, the opposite of what they, how you get educated, how you grow up in Western countries is really, yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is what it's a lot about is giving up society, giving up all of the rites, rules, rituals, and everything that you've learned from society and just 
Take it easy. You don't have to accomplish anything to be happy. In fact, while you're trying to accomplish something, you're not happy. It's only after you finish the job that you can be you can rest. Right. Well, here we're changing what job there is to do, and the job that needs to be done is to stop having jobs to do. That's very strange, I know. The only way to be sure that you have finished all the job is to not have any more jobs. Uh-huh. So every job that comes up, instead of doing that one, just don't do it. And then you've gotten the job done. Mm-hmm. Why? Because it wasn't uh, a job to do at all. It was only a thought of a job to do. Or another way of saying it is uh, problem solving. And the only problem that we have to do or to solve is the one of stop making problems. Stop generating work to do. And just enjoy. You've already got everything you need. Like naturally, I sometimes have the state when I'm like out in nature or yeah, going for a hike or so, where I just feel so satisfied, where I think like, oh, there, there is nothing really to to put on top, to add to this situation, to to make me feel happy or satisfied. It's like mm-hmm. something what naturally happens, yeah, from quite often actually in my life. But uh, yeah, it's uh, I'm struggling like with keeps this, you know, just to keeping this feeling satisfaction or like uh, yeah. usually I get out like pretty fast and then I think oh I have to do this or that or want like another experience or yeah all right so I tell you what why don't we go ahead and finish now I think that you've gotten kind of the basics of where this teaching of the Buddha is going yeah and uh, uh, After we finish the call, then we can make uh, uh, arrangements for your traveling over here. So I'm going to go ahead and finish the uh, recording now. Okay, thank you, Damarato. It was really, yeah. Okay, and stay online. Yeah.